Hey, welcome back to the Carrie Boudet's I channel. This is the evening of, what is this? Yes, that's right. This is the evening of, uh, well, it's Wednesday, uh, January 11th, 2020. We're going we're gonna to pick up where we left off, uh, I think, Monday night with the, with the quant, what, what do we call it? The, the World Quant University's, uh, the first the first exercise, the first chapter of Module 2, which has to do with uh, designing functions and also moves on at some point to various type of predictive models, including linear regression, okay? In the meantime, uh, just sit back, relax, and be back with you folks in 15 minutes.
Oh. Hey, welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Okay. Some of you are going to complain you can't see my face. I'm not sure why it is. But anyway, hey, welcome back. Let's get back to the World Quant University's uh, website. There are assignments for this evening. Okay. First of all, let's take a look at uh, Chan. I'm, I'm also taking a, a short you know, four or five video course on uh, on Power Query in Excel. From uh, his name is Chindu. It's a nice deal, forty bucks. I thought I'd help support the guy. So I, I did. I try to do the homework solution, which involved uh, creating a column and, and then using these figures here to to assign a value to a to a new column. That makes sense. So let's just see what happens up here. To add the salary grouping as a column, you can use the conditional column option and build that kind of a ladder. So we'll use that conditional column. And here the column name is salary group. And if my salary is less than 50,000, then the output would be less than 50K. Then we will add one more clause. If salary is less than 80,000, then the output would be 50 to 80k. We'll add third clause, which is if salary is less than 100,000, then it needs to be 80 to 100k. And else, we don't need to do the thing for one more clause here. We can just use the else clause and then we'll say greater than 100k. So those are the outputs. You can type literally anything the, here. You could, for example, have a label like low salary, medium, high, very high salary or whatever. And when you finish doing that, if you click OK, it's going to add those salary groupings right. here for you. This is an excellent way to bring some sort of extra values based on business rules and then use them in Excel. You could have built this kind of a column in Excel as well. But because this is a Power Query video, I'm teaching you how to do this within Power Query. If you change the conditions and let's just say our criteria is no longer 50 and 80, but it is 50 and 75, then you can use the cog button. So here the cog button, I can click on it and this is going to have those boundaries here and I can simply change the value. So here from 80, I'm going to just change this to 75,000 and rename the values here as 75K and then 75 to 100K like that. Make sure to adjust all the things that need to be adjusted whenever these kind of things change. And when you click OK, that will update. Another way to do these kind of changes is instead of using the cog button, if you have got the formula bar visible on the screen, you can directly edit the items in the formula bar as well. So maybe our less lower range is not 50, it's 45. So I can just type 45,000 here and then rename my labels as well as 45k and you know that's gonna just update as well whenever you finish typing the formula if you press enter that's just gonna change those things as well mm -hmm. yeah i think i had my uh Excel lock up, and so I may have lost all, all the changes I made during the during lesson two. <laughs> but anyway, this is a quick peek here. I'll go get her back over to World Quant University.
document recovery. Excel has recovered the following file. Save this one. Save the ones you wish to keep. No, see what happened is, <laughs> oh, I didn't save my, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I didn't save what? I, I didn't save the, the conditional column with this because right as I got through this here, it crashed. It froze up, and so I wanted to go back and change something, and I had to wind up closing the whole program, which is why we got a recovery back there. That's okay. Now, where are we over here? Okay, so as promised, let's return to, first of all, let's come back over here to GitHub. Okay, regression model to two, do this. Notice this one difference between the is you need to complete one graded task in each lesson notebook in addition to the assignment notebook. Be sure to check for all the, those who all all of these when you're you're checking your score. We also lose we also use the side click learn libraries, you'll see. Grades. See, I don't have any grades yet, I don't understand that. So we're right here, okay? And we're, we're all the way over down here to, uh,
let's drop that. And we, 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 we're all the way down. Uh, so the, the first oh, portion of this thing, all the way down to say 2.16, the first five sections, has to do with building this function right here. Okay? Which does, uh, does uh, just one thing. First of all, it takes a path and a file name, a CSV file name. Then it pulls out the rows uh, that contain the uh, word capital federal. Then it pulls out property type apartment. Then it pulls out uh, any any property uh, USD price less than four hundred thousand. Then it combines these two here into a data frame. Then we then we come over here and we use the quartile function to pull out the 0.10 to 0.9 quartile range. Okay. Then we come back down here again and create one called mask surface area covered in meters. And we, and we, we, we assign the quartiles to low and high. And we come down here and say, uh, we're interested in uh, surface covered area, which is between, uh, with a quartile between point, 0 0.1 and 0 0.9, so you say low and high. Then we assign this back over to a final data frame, okay? And all these here are just the portions of it, okay? So let's come back over here now. All we should have to do here now to get this to run is to bring us up to date. Let's see how this works. So we should be back up to date here because all this down here is just building those. Uh, let's check this. You can see here, uh, these are all apartments, the capital federal, and the price of property USD is less than, is less than 400,000. Let's come on down here to the bottom here then. I mean, we could back down here and rerun this stuff again, right? Let's just look at the plots. Mm -hmm. Value counts. For what? Let's do a subscribe. So you can see the maximum for for surface total area is less than two hundred, uh, less than uh, three hundred thousand. Here's where we created our quantiles. Okay, so this one should be done also. Now, create a scatter plot that shows the, uh, let's come back over here. One last task for our exploratory data analysis. Let's see if there is a relationship that we can see between the price of an apartment and the surface area or the area of the apartment. So I'm gonna zoom in here. And let's just build this whole plot all at once. We're using matplotlib, so I'll do plt scatter. And inside... Let's just go ahead and take this right here. Now, so what's this? What is a scatter plot? Create a scatter plot using map politics. So we're going to create a scatter plot. Price, approximate US price versus surface area cover. Okay. So 
Is this something like side scatter I want to have an X and here that X is going to be surface area covered so surface area covered and we're looking at uh, Y along the Y axis our dependent variable that's going to be DF price approximate USD beautiful so we're looking at price as a function of surface area okay Be okay X equals surface area covered. Now, there's two there's two ways to do this, as I said before. I prefer. I, I think that uh, you know. I think specifying the data separately is, is, is a is a better way. We got a quote. Is in quotes. Whoops. What's right? X is surface here. Y is price per. I mean, using this format is a little bit plainer. Well, what's wrong? Got a quote, there's a comma. All right. So, we got the basic plot down. Let's see scatter plot surface area in our data set. Make sure that the label your x axis. A little break the other night was quite good. Quite useful. Let's try this now. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, let's come back over here for a moment. Okie dokie. So we got this now. Get rid of this. Let's do our X label. Errors per meter. Mm. Our data sets and label your X and Y axis. Beautiful, awesome. And what else? We also need to make sure that we add our axes. You're absolutely right. We'll do PLT X label and we'll set that equal to area, which we'll just grab from the instructions. Awesome. And then we'll do PLT Y label and we'll set that equal to price USD again from the instructions. And last but not least, we definitely need to make sure that we add a title. And so we'll do something like, let's do Buenos Aires. So Buenos Aires, and let's do price versus area. There we go. And I'll do a semi.
semicolon at the end just to block my uh, output there. Beautiful. And if I scroll down and I can see, boy, actually, it looks like there's a pretty, this is bigger than we saw in the Mexico data set. We definitely see a stronger correlation between uh, these two items. So for example, there's like a very clear, to me anyway, there's a very clear kind of... Of course, you would expect the price of the house to go up, okay? You would expect the price of the house to go up, right? This is area per square meter. This is price, okay? But it doesn't tell us whether or not the price per square meter is going up. That's the real question. So I don't think it does. And a line here, especially at the, the lower end, where it does seem that, you know, uh, area does help determine the price of an apartment. So that's good to know. That's good to know. And we'll take that information with us into our model building. Now that we have this scatter plot, let's just talk a moment about linear models and what they are. Now there's a lot of information in the textbook, but for now, I just want you to remember two important things. One, linear models are all about straight lines. And two, linear models are really concerned with distance. Now what do I mean by those two things? Let me go to my board here. And here's our scatter plot. And the first thing is linear models are all about lines. That's where they get their name, linear. And with linear models, what we're trying to do is we're trying to draw a line that best fits our data. In this case, that best describes the relationship between the area of an apartment and the price of an apartment. And the reason we're doing that is so that when we encounter well, a new apartment, we... for example, let's say one that costs... The question is this, does the price per square meter go up as the, as a size of the, of the, of the, uh, I mean, we, you would expect that you, you expect larger apartments to cost more money. But the question, does the price per square meter go up as the, as the area goes up? That's the question. But anyway, okay, let's just move on now or one that has 80 square meters, we can just go up to our line and then go over to our y-axis here and say, oh, well, my prediction is that a, an apartment with 80 square meters is going to be around $200,000. So we create these linear models because we want to use it to make predictions. The second point is that linear models are really concerned with distance. Now, what does that mean? Well, if I look at my data points here, what I want to do is I want to draw a line that is essentially following the training data. It's as close to the training data as possible. I don't think we actually calculated. All we did is clean here. We didn't actually calculate any numbers. I don't think did we? Here's the question. Is 
is price per square meter a better measure than simply price? That's the question. Is price per square meter better than just price? Come back up here, here. Let's just add, so I can't remember, I can't remember what columns we had. DF dot. Property, surface area, total mass. Price, uh, U.S. per square meter. Okay. So let's take this. So we actually, as I suspected, the actual seat, uh, Okay, what this tells us is the actual price, you got some outlier, but overall, the overall trend is that the price, you know, is pretty much horizontal. You know, there's volatility and stuff here. Of course, we can get rid of some of that, right? Uh, interesting. Okay. possible. Now this model, the line I just drew, looks pretty good. But if my model looked like this, you would say, actually, this is not a very good model because it doesn't fit the data at all. It's very far away from the data. Likewise, if I had a model that... Let's just try something for the fun of it here. Let's just load... And it does. The, the, the regression line is while there's volatility overall. Uh, if, if you look at a at a given function here, right? Uh, what happens if you come back up here and reverse these?
that looked like this, you would say this is not a very good model because it doesn't follow the data. And especially at the extremes here, it's very far from our actual data points. So that's what I mean when I talk about distance being important to a linear model. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, two reasons. One, when you're training a linear model, what's happening under the hood is it's following a, an algorithm, a mathematical equation, so that it can find exactly where that line needs to be to minimize the distance between that line and all of the data points. So when it's training itself, it's trying to minimize distance. So this is sort of a computational thing. The second thing is when we combine this importance and distance and the fact that it's all about straight lines, linear models are very good when your data actually has some sort of linear relationship. Like we can see here, a line is actually a pretty good describer of the relationship between apartment size and right, apartment so you, price. I mean, you would but that's you would expect as the size of the apartment goes up, you would expect the price to increase. So that's not really the question. The question we answered above that was, does the price per square meter go up as a, as the size of the house goes up? See, that was a question up here. Okay, surface area covered the size of the, the size of the, of the of the building, and the price per square meter. All right, and the answer is it stays per, it stays pretty consistent. Yeah, we got to, we got quite a few outliers up there. We could of course use the quantile function to get rid of some of those outliers, right? Hmm? Let's come back down and see what this rascal has to tell us. It's not always the case. If you have data that's not linear, right? It doesn't follow a straight line. A linear model isn't going to be very good. And so when you see during your exploratory data analysis that there don't seem to be clear linear relationships, it might be a better idea to use some of the other models that we'll learn about in subsequent projects. Models that aren't limited to drawing straight lines and that aren't no, concerned right. about distance, but rather look at other measurements when they're training themselves to fit the data. So keep that in mind. Linear models are all about straight lines, and they're all about minimizing the distance. Let's just take a brief detour here, as this happens all the time. And you're thinking Oh, well, this is a beautiful thing. Now, now, you see, here's the thing. They're going to teach us how to, I'm guessing, to calculate, uh, uh, you know, to calculate a, uh, a low as a, a regression line. Why, why, why don't I just teach us how to use regplot? You know, you know, it's pointless to learn how to do something like this when, when somewhere...
between those straight lines and then the training data. Let's see. Split. A key part of any model building project is separating your target, the thing you want to predict, from your features, the information your model will use to make the predictions. And since this is our first model, we'll just use one feature, apartment size. A key part in any model building project is separating your target, the thing you want to predict from your feature, the information model will be used to, to predict. So uh, since our first since this is the first model, what is predicted on one feature? Apartment size. So we want to, we want to try to do what? Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Before we dive into the next activity, let's just take a second to review where we are in this kind of machine learning workflow that we started with at the beginning of this lesson. So going to the notebook, and I'm going to click on the table of contents here, and I can see that we are still in the prepare data stage, and we've done our importing, we've done our exploring, and now we need to split. All right, so what do I mean when I say split? There are a Do the rabbi and psychiatrist disagree? I don't know. Do they? Not alive. Hey, look, I'm alive. Calendar notification trashes out. This is taken care of. Couple splits that you do during this stage. For now, we're just going to do one of them, which is splitting or dividing our data set into a feature matrix and a target vector. Now, I'm going to be repeating this over and over again. Feature matrix, target vector. Let me talk a little bit about why that's important, all right? So first, let's think about what a data set is, all right? So let's say that this is my data frame. I'll do a little representation of it here. And I'm going to have, let's see, these are our rows, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And let's say that we have area, these are our columns, and we have price. And, you know, a lot of times, actually, you know what, we can make this much even bigger. A lot of times you have a lot of other different features, you know, whose names I have no idea. Let's just call them F1, F2, F3, whatever. All right. So these are all of our different features and we have our values going down this way. Beautiful. And if we were going to, like, think about this using uh, our math brains, all right, so if we're thinking about this using our math brains, this is a matrix, right? It's like a grid of numbers. And so what we need to do is we need to take this grid of numbers and we need to kind of chop it up a little bit. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to chop it up into a feature 
matrix, a feature matrix. So what we're going to do is essentially, let's just take, we're just going to divide it this way. All right, beautiful. And so on the right hand side, what I have is I have a matrix. And I know that this is a matrix because it has multiple rows and multiple columns. All right, so we can think of it as a rectangle. And then on the other side of that dividing line, what I have is a vector. I have a vector because it's just a single kind of uh, list of numbers. I mean, it's not not Python list. It's just like a, a a series of numbers. All right. And so this this guy right here, our feature matrix, has two dimensions. Right. We can see that this one is like four rows and three columns, whereas price is kind of one dimensional. It's just a single kind of string or series of numbers. And that's why we call the first thing our feature matrix. And the second thing we call that our target vector. All right. So features, the things that our model will look at to make its predictions and target the thing that our model wants to predict. Beautiful. And when we are doing our um, uh, when we're abbreviating this, because, uh, our feature matrix is a matrix, we always use a capital X, capital letters for matrices. And because our vector is one dimensional, it's a vector, we're going to use a lowercase y. So it's always big X and little y. So if you remember anything from all of this, uh, discussion, you always need to divide your data into big X and little y, all right? Your feature matrix and your target vector. So with that in mind, let me turn off my math brain here. There we go. And let's go to the old notebook and let's start by creating our feature matrix. Now notice here that we're going to be using the big X to refer to our feature matrix. And we're also using an underscore for train. And this is just to make us remember that this is the data that we're using to train our model, as opposed to the uh, data that we use to maybe test our model later on. Now, we only are, we're going to start with just here we have features and we have a list. So if we wanted multiple columns, we could pass in multiple columns. But for now, we're just going to do one column. All right. So I know that we talked about feature matrices having multiple columns. But in this case, we're just going to do for the purposes of uh, pedagogy, we're just going to keep it as one column. So in order to create that feature matrix, I'll do DF and then inside square brackets, I'll put in my features. Beautiful. And then if I look at, let's see here, let's look at xtrain.head. And if I hit shift and enter, we can see that this looks like a data frame. It doesn't look like a series. So we know that it's, if it's a data frame, it's a matrix. And if we look at dot shape, what we'll see is that we have our 1,343 rows. And even though we only have one column, there's still a one there, right? So it's still two dimensional. Beautiful. So we have our feature matrix, our big X, our X train. And I'll go through the assert statement just to make sure we are correct. And indeed we are. So we're good to go. So now we have our feature matrix. Let's go on and make our target vector.
now that we have now that we have a features or a feature anyway the next step is to create a target by the way you may have noticed that we're adding underscore train tag to the variables for one our feature matrix and target vectors this is to remind us that the data will be used to train our tra our model not the not the data to we will use to test it okay I'll mention what we're doing right here sometimes is called feature engineering. This means you're creating uh, normally, you know, new, uh, this, this new variables basically, okay? So, All right, time for the target vector. So here, notice that we're using y, and it's a lowercase y, so big X, little y, but we're still using the underscore train to remind us that this is our training data, not our testing data. Mm -hmm. Now, before with features, we had a list. Now, for our target, we're just doing the string. Now, why is that important? Well, if I do df and then square brackets target, and then I look at y train dot head, what we'll see is this is a series, right? This is a series, not a data frame. And if I look at the shape of this series, I can see that we have a hundred or 1,343 values in it, but after this comma, there's nothing else, right? So there's only one dimension. This is a vector, right? That tells us it's a vector. And so if I put this in my, um, if I put this in the assert statement here and try to run this, I can see that nothing happens. So that means I'm good to go. I've split my data into my big X, my little Y, my feature matrix, and my target vector, and now I'm ready to actually be. All right, time for the target vector. So here, notice that we're using Y, and it's a lowercase y, so big X, little y, but we're still using the underscore train to remind us that this is our training data, not our testing data. Now, before with features, we had a list. Now, for our target, we're just doing the string. Now, why is that important? Well, if I do df and then square brackets target, and then I look at y train dot head, what we'll see is this is a series, right? This is a series, not a data frame. And if I look at the shape of this series, I can see that we have a hundred or 1,343 values in it. But after this comma, there's nothing else, right? So there's only one dimension. This is a vector, right? That tells us it's a vector. And so if I
All right, it's time to build the model. If you're like me, you've been waiting weeks. You guys have been working with Project 1, now you're in Project 2, and we finally get to build our model. So I'm super, super excited that we get to do this together. Now, remember that there are three different parts to building a model, uh, baseline, iterate, and evaluate. So let's start with our baseline. Now, the idea of a baseline is that you want to get a sense of how good does your model need to, per to perform in order to be useful to your stakeholders. So you're basically setting a baseline for performance that your model needs to beat in order to be worth it. All right. So with that in mind, let's go here to the old notebook. And in order to create a baseline, the first thing we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, is this a regression problem or a classification problem? So if it's a regression problem, the thing that we're trying to predict, our target, is some sort of continuous value. For example, the price of an apartment can range between zero dollars and, you know, millions of dollars, depending on the apartment. So this is a regression problem. Now, if it were a classification problem, that would be different, right? Maybe we were trying to predict whether, um, whether an apartment, uh, would sell in the next six months, right? The two choices are yes or no. Those are two categories. Uh, yeah, pretty much. But I, I've used like, you know, uh, regression. I mean, I, I, I plotted like smooth curves regression lines and R before, but I never actually, you know, of course, if you think about it, everything's machine learning, right? <laughs> I mean, Python, Python is machine learning program, right? But yeah, um, I've never actually done any, any predictive modeling. But anyway, so, uh, hey, how you doing, friend? Thanks for stopping by. And, and this your first time, BBD, BB, BD, uh, BB dog? Excellent. Okay. So, so, so where do you live? Where are you located at in the world? You're the second or third person from Brazil I've, I've had dropped by by chat session. It works as analytics engineer at a bank. Well, if you need if you need a junior level data analyst, be sure to give me a holler, okay? <laughs> uh, anyway, excellent. So, uh, so what's your education background? Do you have a degree plus uh, or what? Yeah, what? Oh, excellent. Very good. So how long, how long have you been uh, doing like analytics for, for a profession?
<laughs> well, the first thing you have to do is I'm an amateur. Uh, it's hard to believe I, I, I do data analytics for fun. Okay. Uh, no formal training. Uh, I learned other than SQL 20 years ago or more. Uh, five years ago, uh, as part of my uh, interest in astronomy, I taught a, I, uh, I learned our program in, in order to plot sunspot activity, obviously on the sun. Uh, uh, what I'm doing here is this is what's called World Quant University. This is their data science lab. Well, it's, it's completely free. Okay, it's eight modules, four to five module uh, uh, assignment uh, uh, part consists of four to five different projects in each in each in each module. Plus a, and then and uh, and plus an assignment it gets graded. But yeah, it's it, it's completely free. It's it's all Python based, and uh, I'm just beginning the the, uh, the module has to do with linear regression models and stuff like that. So yeah, of course, fish and chips up there is, is from the UK. He, he he's another promising young uh, data analyst. Okay, very good. Excellent. Yeah. So what what are the main tools you work with at your at your job? Yeah, I, I'm actually retired. I'm 67 years old. I, I, I retired when I was 62. So I have lots of time on my hand. AWS and Python plus lives like, uh, yep. I, I'm actually starting to work with Sidekick Learn in this second module here, okay? That's, that's, that's where I'm at right now, uh, linear regression. Yeah, and Seaborn, yep, yep. I actually did a C, I, I actually did a re, a, uh, Regression, the the the, the uh, Seaborn reg plot right up here, plotting a linear regression with uh, surface area. These are probability surface area uh, in square meters and the price per square meter. Okay, just want to take a look at that. But up here, you can see we do regular stuff. <laughs> How old is your father? Well, I'm telling you, if, you know, I, I I highly recommend this 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 uh, World Quant University. Okay. Oh, he's a young man. I'm 67. Here, give give, give your father a link to this site right here. Like I say, it's it's Python based. So far, so far, I've been. Uh, do you have? Do you have LinkedIn? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. If your father's interested in Python, have him take a look at that site. Like I say, the data science la uh, lab is com is completely free. You know, they don't ask you for money. There's no bag or anything like that. Yeah. So tell me. So tell me. Are you are you on uh, LinkedIn then? LinkedIn. I know I'm here over. I know I'm over here someplace. Let's see. 
Here you go. Here, here's my LinkedIn. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I, you know, I, I I wouldn't say I'm aggressively looking for a job, but if the right offer came along uh, and it was remote, sure, I'd jump at it for the right amount of money, of course. Is that you right there? <laughs> okay, you can help me. You can help with that also. I'll go ahead and send you a connection there. Okay, there you go. I take I take all the help I can get in terms of learning. <laughs> So is your dad looking for a new career or just a hobby to keep him busy in his retirement? Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for stopping by. Be sure to click that uh, that subscribe and like. Uh, click the subscribe button on YouTube and also click the bell button. That would be notified whenever I go live, okay? <laughs> I can understand that, yeah. I'm very curious about data and, and various subjects like that, you know. Yeah. My, my general screaming uh, is Monday through Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern time. That's that's the Eastern U.S. time, New York time, okay? If you click the bell, you'll be notified whenever I go live. So do you do any streaming at all? Games or programming or anything? Be sure to give your father the link, the link to my site also. He can drop, he can stop by and say hi sometime if he gets a chance. Yeah. Do you, have you ever seen one called Yuka with data? There you go. There, there's her handle. She's she's a promising young data analyst, also. Primary, she's primary Python now. There, uh, there used to be a couple other people, but they don't stream anymore. Uh, kind of odd. It's, uh, there's, there's also a guy called Data Basics. He's kind of kind of an interesting guy. Yeah, if you if you if you uh, if you, uh, if you go by Yuka Stream, be sure to tell her I sent you. you ready? Yeah, here's a guy, Nick Wan. He's kind of inter He's actually the data science manager for the Cincinnati Reds ball team students. back here, professional baseball team back I here do, in the I U.S. Need PB he's he's mainly a Python system. guy, also. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Good Lord, what 
the database is uh, another guy. He, he tends to kind of range all over the place, programming, SQL, stuff like that. He's, he's always trying to learn some new stuff. <laughs> Nick Juan. <laughs> yeah. You should be sure to follow Yuka, too. All right. You tell her I sent you. She, uh, Yuka lives on the west coast of the U.S., and so it's, it's three hours behind us, three hours behind Eastern time. Sometimes she starts streaming about midnight just for the fun of it. Most of the time she starts streaming about, say, noon, noon uh, between noon and two o'clock uh, East Coast time. I'm not sure what, uh, what, what time is it in Brazil right now? Okay, so yeah, so you're uh, you're about three hours at eleven twelve. You're three hours ahead of me, okay. Which means if, if she streamed at twelve o'clock my time, it'd be three p.m. your time. Okay, man. Have a nice have a nice the rest of your week, and hey, stop by whenever you can. I enjoy talking to you. Thanks so much for the offer. I appreciate it, friend. All right, time for the target vector. So here, notice that we're using Y and it's a lowercase Y, so big X, little Y, but we're still using the underscore train to remind us that this is our training data, not our testing data. Now, before with features, we had a list. Now, for our target, we're just doing the string. Now, why is that important? Well, if I do df and then square brackets target, and then I look at y train dot head, what we'll see is this is a series, right? This is a series, not a data frame. And if I I look at the shape of this series, I can see that we have 100 or 1,343 values in it, but after this comma, there's nothing else, right? So there's only one dimension. Dimension, this is a vector right? That tells us it's a vector. And so if I put this in my, um, if I put this in the, I thought we created X. Okay. Uh, you, you can, you can send it, you can send it to me on Facebook if you want to.
Yeah, you can just you can just you can just send to me on Facebook Messenger if you want to. Yes, I know. <laughs> I don't know how to fix that. Yeah, so just send it to me on Facebook. Or you can email it to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how to change that. What happened to X shape or X train? The assert statement here and try to run this, I can see that nothing happens, so that means I'm good to go. I've split my data into my big X, my little Y. What happened to the X trains back up here. Okay. I'll be right back. I'll get me get me a little snack. So we would do, be doing classification, but in this case we're doing regression. And so what that means is that in order to set our baseline, 
we need to start by finding what is the mean value for our Y train. So when you're setting a baseline, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, is this a regression problem or a classification problem? So like a classification problem would be if you're trying to predict whether or not an apartment has clean floors or dirty floors based on, I don't know, the size of the apartment or where the apartment's located. There are only two choices, clean or dirty. Now, if it's a regression problem, the thing that you're trying to predict, your target is a continuous value. For example, the price of an apartment can go between zero and, you know, millions and millions of dollars. So this is a regression problem. All right, now what does this mean for our baseline? Well, a good way to think of a baseline model is kind of like a dumb model, or we call it a naive model because we don't want it to feel bad. We want it to have good model self-esteem. So we call it a naive model. And the idea of a naive model is that it can only make a single prediction, no matter the size of the apartment, no matter what the apartment looks like, it's always going to just come back with the same prediction. And in the case of a regression problem, a really good prediction to always make is just make the mean price your prediction. So if I zoom in here, what we could do is I could do y mean, y mean, well, I could take my y train and do dot mean, and I'll do y mean here, shift and enter. And what this tells me is that the mean apartment price in our data set is around $135,000. And so for our naive model, what it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, every time I see an apartment, I'm just going to predict that its price is going to be $1,335 thousand dollars. All right. So now we have that guess that our naive model is going to make over and over again. And then in the next task, let's actually see how we would evaluate this model. If you're like me, you've been waiting weeks. You guys have been working with Project 1, now you're in Project 2, and we finally get to build our model. So I'm super, super excited that we get to do this together. Now, remember that there are three different parts to building a model. Uh, baseline, iterate, and evaluate. So let's start with our baseline. Now, the idea of a baseline is that you want to get a sense of how good does your model need to, per to perform in order to be useful to your stakeholders. So you're basically setting a baseline for performance that your model needs to beat in order to be worth it. All right. So with that in mind, let's go here to the old notebook. And in order to create a baseline, the first thing we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, is this a regression problem or a classification problem? So if it's a regression problem, the thing that we're trying to predict, our target is some sort of continuous value. For example, the price of an apartment can range between zero dollars and, you know, millions of dollars, depending on the apartment. So this is a regression problem. 
Now, if it were a classification problem, that would be different, right? Maybe we were trying to predict whether, um, whether an apartment, uh, would sell in the next six months, right? The two choices are yes or no. Those are two categories. So we would do, be doing classification. But in this case, we're doing regression. And so what that means is that in order to set our baseline, we need to start by finding what is the mean value for our Y train. So when you're setting a baseline, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, is this a regression problem or a classification problem? So like a classification problem would be if you're trying to predict whether or not an apartment has clean floors or dirty floors based on, I don't know, the size of the apartment or where the apartment's located. There are only two choices, clean or dirty. Now, if it's a regression problem, the thing that you're trying to predict, your target is a continuous value. For example, the price of an apartment can go between zero and, you know, millions and millions of dollars. So this is a regression problem. All right. Now, what does this mean for our baseline? Well, a good way to think of a baseline model is kind of like a dumb model, or we call it a naive model because we don't want it to feel bad. We want it to have good model self-esteem. So we call it a naive model. And the idea of a naive model is that it can only make a single prediction, no matter the size of the apartment, no matter what the apartment looks like, it's always going to just come back with the same prediction. And in the case of a regression problem, a really good prediction to always make is just make the mean price your prediction. So if I zoom in here, what we could do is I could do Y mean, Y mean, well, I could take my Y train and do dot mean, and I'll do Y mean here, shift and enter. And what this tells me is that the mean apartment price in our data set is around $135,000. And so for our naive model, what it's going to do is it's going to say, okay, Did I run my target back up here? If I can spell train, it'd be much more helpful. Every time I see an apartment, I'm just going to predict that its price is going to be $1,335,000, all right? So now we have that guess that our naive model is going to make over and over again. And then in the next task, let's actually see how we would evaluate this model. Yes, let's do
All right, we're establishing our baseline. We know that the mean apartment price uh, for our training data is $135,000. And so now we need to make our model predict that number over and over again. So if I zoom in here in our notebook, we know what our mean apartment price is. We have it highlighted up here. And now we just need to make a list of predictions of that number over and over and over and over again. So let's go here to Y predict baseline. So Y predict baseline. And we want to take Y mean. So we have our Y mean. And actually, let's do Y predict baseline here just to just so we're kind of uh, we, we see what our output is. There we go. Beautiful. And let's see, next thing is we actually need a list, right? So why don't we take Y mean and let's put it inside a list. All right, awesome. We're getting there. Now, this is, it's a list. It has one prediction in it. We actually want a, a list of the same prediction over and over again, and we want that list to be as long as our Y train data set. So what that means is that we're going to do Y mean, we have it inside a list, and we're going to multiply it by the length of Y train. We'll multiply it by the length of Y train, and now this is going to be a long list, so I don't want to look at all of it. So I'll use my square brackets and just say, give me the first five values. Beautiful. All right. So what I how have or what I now have is I have a list. And if I just check out the length of this list here, there we go. Y train. Beautiful. And let's just. Just make sure that this is the same size as our Y train. So 1,343. Yep, true. Excellent. Okay, so we now have our list of predictions. Let's see if we can visualize what these predictions look like. What? What happened here?
So the question is this. Why calculate the new regression line if you got a plot like Seaborn that actually has a built-in function? We figured out what the mean value is of our target, our little y, and then we created a list, y predict baseline, with that value repeated over and over again. But it would be better to kind of understand this as our baseline model if we could actually make a visualization of it. So here we are in the notebook. I'm on task 2, 1, 12, and I will zoom in. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to run the code that we have here as is. And if I do that, we can see that we have a scatter plot. And unpacking what's on this scatter plot, Along the x-axis, we have our apartment sizes. And then along the y-axis, we have our apartment but what prices. About and so what we can see is that every dot, every point in this scatter plot has an area, the size of the apartment, and then it also has a price. So if we're going to plot out a line, we need to provide both x and y coordinates. So now let's think about how we're going to plot out the line that is our baseline model. I'm going to scroll up here, and I'm going to start with PLT plot. This is always the way you start when you want to plot a line in matplotlib. And then I need to give x and y coordinates. Now, with our x coordinates, we know that they are here in our big X train, all right, in our training feature matrix. So we can put them in there. And then all of our y values for our baseline model, remember it always predicts the same price, whatever that mean is. So we'll do y predict baseline. And if I hit shift and actually before I hit shift and enter, let's add a couple other things here. So first, let's add a color so that it contrasts with, um, with the blue. So let's have an orange. And then let's also add a label here so that we can see what this line represents, and we'll just call this baseline model. All right, beautiful. So now that we have all of that passed in, let's hit shift and enter here, and we get a type error. Let me zoom out and see if we can investigate what's going on here. I'm going to scroll down, and I always go right to the bottom, and what I can see here is invalid index error, slice, 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 none. Now, this isn't a particularly helpful error, but what this is suggesting to me is that matplotlib is having trouble slicing or finding the data that we're passing in. So maybe the problem is that we're passing it in in the wrong way. I'm going to scroll up to kind of show you what I mean, and then we'll kind of go from there. So here's our original code, and I'll create a cell up above where we were working, and then I'll zoom in, and Let's start with X train. Now, if we look at the type, so the data type here, X train is a data frame. So if we look at X train dot head, it looks like a data frame. And if we do X train dot shape, we can see here that it has two dimensions. And it kind of seems like maybe matplotlib is having a hard time accessing data in a two dimensional data frame. Maybe it just doesn't like data frames at all. So there are a couple ways that we can get around this. One thing that we could do is, if we again just look at head here, and what we can see is that, yes, this is a data frame, but actually there's only one column in it. And that's the only column that we want. So instead of passing in the whole data frame, we could just pass in one column. So if we passed in surface area covered dot and there we go. So this gives us a slightly different data type. In fact, if we look at the type here, we can see that it's a pandas series, which is a fancy word of saying it's a column from a data frame. So one thing that we could do is we could just pass in this series and see if that works. Let's try that. I'll hit shift and enter. There we go. Now it's working. Okay. So that's one way that we So there are a couple ways that we can get around this. One thing that we could do is, if we again just look at head here, and what we
can see is that, yes, this is a data frame, but actually there's only one column in it. And that's the only column that we want. So instead of passing in the whole data frame, we could just pass in one column. So if we passed in surface area covered dot head, there we go. So this gives us a slightly different data type. In fact, if we look at the type here, we can see that it's a pandas series, which is a fancy word of saying it's a column from a data frame. So one thing that we could do is we could just pass in this series and see if that works. Let's try that. I'll hit shift and enter. There we go. Now it's working. Okay. So that's one way that we can do it. And then another way that we can do it
is if you look up at X train, if you ever want to get the values out of a data frame without all of the other stuff that comes with the data frame, you can always do X train values. And that doesn't return a data frame. It doesn't return a series. It returns something called an ND array, which is basically like a fancy list. We'll sort of be learning about NumPy and ND arrays kind of sprinkled throughout this program. So if we look at this here, let me just look at the first couple values here. So maybe one. No, that won't work. Let's look at one. Let's look at the first, I don't know, say five values here. And we can see here that this is sort of like a column, but it also looks kind of like a nested list. So it might be that pan, uh, matplotlib would be happier with the values in this format. And so if I do xtrain values and I paste them in, I think we should get the same thing. And indeed we do. Awesome. So those are two ways that we can work around the issue of matplot surface area covered dot head. There we go. So this gives us a slightly different data type. In fact, if we look at the type here, we can see that it's a pandas series, which is a fancy word of saying it's a column from a data frame. So one thing that we could do is we could just pass in this series and see if that works. Let's try that. I'll hit shift and enter. There we go. Now it's working. That's not a very OK. Good fit, so that's one way that we can do it. And then another way that we can do it is if you look up at X train, if you ever want to get the values out of a data frame without all of the other stuff that comes with the data frame, you can always do X train values. And that doesn't return a data frame. It doesn't return a series. It returns something called an ND array, which is basically like a fancy list. We'll sort of be learning about NumPy and ND arrays kind of sprinkled throughout this program. So if we look at this here, let me just look at the first couple values here. So maybe one. No, that won't work. Let's look at one. Let's look at the first, I don't know, say five values here. And we can see here that this is sort of like a column, but it also looks kind of like a nested list. So it might be that pan, uh, matplotlib would be happier with the values in this format. And so if I do xtrain values and I paste them in, I think we should get the same thing, and indeed we do. Awesome. So those are two ways that we can work around the issue of matplotlib not wanting to plot out a data frame or data in a data frame. Now, turning to this actual model itself, what are we seeing here? What is represented? Well, what we see is that no matter, no matter the size of your apartment, our model will always predict this particular price. So it looks like about around 140, something like that. And so this is what our model looks like, all right? If we were to plot out our line, this is what it looks like. Now, looking at this line here,
here. Do you think that this is following the trend in the data? Do you think this line is doing a no, good not. job of making predictions? And a follow-up question, why do you think it is or is not? What is the visual cue here that you're looking at that's telling you that this is a good or not a good model? Well, so, yeah, a lot of you are saying, and I think you're right, you know, this line is flat, but our data seems to have more of a slant to it. That is to say, as apartments get bigger, they tend to get more expensive. And so this is okay for our baseline model, but as we'll see in... We're back in like tube six of a dog still. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Following tasks are are
Our, when we train our model, we'll get much better performance. Now, one last thing I just want to say, here we're looking at this visually, we're assessing our baseline visually, but as data scientists, we can't just rely on visualization alone. We need to think of some sort of mathematical or numerical way to assess the performance of this model. So that's exactly what we'll be doing in the next task, and I'll see you for that in the next video. Hmm. All right, things are getting exciting. Why? Because we've taken our data and we've split it. We have our feature matrix area, we have our target vector price, and we are going to try to use area to predict price. Now, we created a scatter plot to see if there was some sort of correlation there. We did see something, and so when we were creating our baseline model, we started with the mean uh, uh, price in our training data, and we plotted that against the data. Now, we see that our model, this baseline model, doesn't really follow the data, so we know it's not a great model, but we need some sort of numerical evaluation of the performance of this model, and that's where performance metrics come in. So, like the name implies, performance metrics are a way to measure the performance of your model. What metric you use depends on the type of problem. There are... Just take a quick look at YouTube here. Be back with you in one moment here. Welcome back to Dark Corner Streaming. We're looking at new to Netflix Vampires versus the Bronx most audience baiting title since Snakes on a Plane. We got vampires in the Bronx. He's not wrong. Ah! It's hard to talk about Vampires vs. the Bronx without talking about other films, partly because it openly references them. I've got time for any film that references Nosferatu director F.W. Murnau, and the image is Vladimir and Taylor. But the film also draws on a lot of other stuff, most notably Attack the Block, the film that made a star of John Boyega. And like that film, it goes for a mix of horror and social commentary. Mm. I'm going to wipe you out. Why? Not 
also has a strong 85. Aquin kids save the world more often. Okay, where are we here now? Let's see what this rascal has to say. There are metrics for classification. There are metrics for um, uh, regression. There are metrics for everything. But one of the most uh, popular metrics or most used metrics for regression problems is mean absolute error. So let's just take a little bit of a deep dive into mean absolute error, and then we can actually write the code. So here is a picture of our model. And what I'm going to do is I'm just, I paste it here onto my blackboard because I want to think about how this is all calculated. So let me make some room here on my desk. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Live TV. What are you going to do? All right. So what I have here is the way that mean absolute error works. So let's just call this MAE for short. The way mean absolute error works is on the one hand, I have what are the true values of my data. So these blue data points that you see, these are the actual data. These are the actual prices. And then with that, whoops, I don't know what happened there. With that, I have my predictions. And actually, whenever I want to uh, symbolize in math talk that I have a prediction, I put this little hat on top. This is the, this is the prediction hat. All right. So whenever you're, a data scientist, you have to put on your prediction hat whenever you're doing machine learning uh, modeling. <laughs> so I have my prediction. And then looking in on this data, let's take the example of this data point here. So notice that this data point is up at around a quarter million dollars. And notice that the prediction for our model puts it at around 100 and whatever it was, our baseline was 140 something, 130 something, I don't know. So there is a difference here. There is a difference. And if we were going to uh, evaluate this difference, right, we would say that this number here is higher than this number here. So we have some sort of positive difference. In this case, it's a difference of like, you know, $100,000. All right, beautiful. So that's what happens when our model underestimates the price we get this difference that's a big positive number. Now, what if we have an error that the, uh, goes the other way? Here's another data point, and we can see that the actual value is somewhere at around under 50,000, whereas our model is predicting something much bigger, again, at around 140 something or whatever it was. And so here, we're gonna have a very big negative number. So if we do this for all of our data set, we're going to have a bunch of positive numbers and we're going to have a bunch of negative numbers. Now, we don't want these numbers to cancel each other out. We want to take all of this error and add it together. But if we add together a bunch of positive numbers and a bunch of negative numbers, they're going to cancel each other out. So what we do is we let me just move this over a little bit. Beautiful. So what we do is we take the absolute value. We take the absolute value of that error. And what we'll do is we're just going to sum up. This is the little epsilon, the little sum up thing. I think this is actually called. We're going to sum up all of those errors. And then we're going to divide them by the number of data points in our data set. All right. Mm -hmm. So we take all the differences between our model and the actual values, between the predictions and the actual ground truth. We then add them all up, we take the absolute value, we add them all up, and then we divide them by the number of data points in our data set. And so what we're saying is, on average, our model is wrong by about this much. Now, what's a good mean absolute uh, error and what's a bad mean absolute error? Well, a good mean absolute error is going to be somewhere at a rate at around zero. So that's going to be something where it's like, you know, if you have a model that looks exactly like this and the data points follow your model exactly, then you're going to have a mean absolute error of zero. So zero is what you want to shoot for. You want to get as close to zero as you can. By the way, if you get an actual zero, something is probably wrong with your model. I would just check. But you want to get close to zero. And then mean absolute error can be as big as, you know, who knows? It can be as big as you want, right? It can be as big as the data allows. So there's no upper bound on mean absolute error. All right. And then the other thing that's important to remember is that mean absolute error, the unit of measurement is going to be whatever the unit of measurement is 
for your y-axis, the thing that you're predicting, all right? So our mean absolute error is going to be somewhere between zero and affinity, and it's going to be in US dollars, all right? So that's mean absolute error. With that in mind, let's go back to our notebook, and let's actually put together the code here. So I'm going to scroll down to where we are. Beautiful. And the way I'm going to calculate the mean absolute error is I'm going to take that mean absolute error function that we imported from the metrics module in scikit-learn. So I'll do mean absolute error. And mean absolute error takes two arguments. The first is it takes the true labels. So the true values, y train, and then our predicted values, which in this case is y predict baseline. Beautiful. And then what we're going to be doing here down below is we're going to print out two things. We're going to print out the mean apartment price, just so we have an idea of that. And then we're going to print out our baseline. And notice here that I'm just going to round these to two decimal places, just so we don't have a lot of decimal places here. So if I hit Shift and Enter, I can see that our mean apartment price is around 135,000. So 135,000, and what my baseline mean absolute error is telling me that it is, is that if I guessed 135,000 for every property in this data set, on average, I would be off my guess, my estimates would be off, my predictions would be off by around $45,000. All right, things are getting exciting. Why? Because we've taken our data and we've split it. We have our feature matrix area, we have our target vector price, and we are going to try to use area to predict price. Now, we created a scatter plot to see if there was some sort of correlation there. We did see something, and so when we were creating our baseline model, we started with the mean uh, uh, price in our training data, and we plotted that against the data. Now, we see that our model, this baseline model, doesn't really follow the data, so we know it's not a great model, but we need some sort of numerical evaluation of the performance of this model, and that's where performance metrics come in. So, like the name implies, performance metrics are a way to measure the performance of your model. What metric you use depends on the type of problem. There are metrics for classification, there are metrics for um, uh, regression, there are metrics for everything. But one of the most uh, popular metrics or most used metrics for regression problems is mean absolute error. So let's just take a little bit of a deep dive into mean absolute error, and then we can actually write the code. So here is a picture of our model. And what I'm going to do is I'm just, I paste it here onto my blackboard because I want to think about how this is all calculated. So let me make some room here on my desk. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Live TV, what are you gonna do? All right, so what I have here is the way that mean absolute error works. So let's just call this MAE for short. The way mean absolute error works is on the one hand, I have what are the true values of my data. So these blue data points that you see, these are the actual data. These are the actual prices. And then with that, whoops, I don't know what happened there. With that, I have my predictions. And actually, whenever I want to uh, symbolize in math talk that I have a prediction, I put this little hat on top. This is the this is the prediction hat, all right? So whenever you're 
a data scientist, you have to put on your prediction hat whenever you're doing machine learning uh, modeling. <laughs> so I have my prediction. And then looking in on this data, let's take the example of this data point here. So notice that this data point is up at around a quarter million dollars. And notice that the prediction for our model puts it at around 100 and whatever it was, our baseline was 140 something, 130 something, I don't know. So there is a difference here. There is a difference. And if we were going to uh, evaluate this difference, right, we would say that this number here is higher than this number here. So we have some sort of positive difference. In this case, it's a difference of like, you know, $100,000. All right, beautiful. So that's what happens when our model underestimates the price. We get this difference that's a big positive number. Now, what if we have an error that the, uh, goes the other way? Here's another data point, and we can see that the actual value is somewhere at around under 50,000, whereas our model is predicting something much bigger, again, at around 140 something or whatever it was. And so here, we're gonna have a very big negative number. So if we do this for all of our data set, we're going to have a bunch of positive numbers and we're going to have a bunch of negative numbers. Now, we don't want these numbers to cancel each other out. We want to take all of this error and add it together. But if we add together a bunch of positive numbers and a bunch of negative numbers, they're going to cancel each other out. So what we do is we let me just move this over a little bit. Beautiful. So what we do is we take the absolute value. We take the absolute value of that error. And what we'll do is we're just going to sum up. This is the little epsilon, the little sum up thing. We're going to sum up all of those errors. And then we're going to divide them by the number of data points in our data set. All right. So we take all the differences between our model and the actual values, between the predictions and the actual ground truth. We then add them all up, we take the absolute value, we add them all up, and then we divide them by the number of data points in our data set. And so what we're saying is, on average, our model is wrong by about this much. Now, what's a good mean absolute uh, error and what's a bad mean absolute error? Well, a good mean absolute error is going to be somewhere at a right at around zero. So that's going to be something where it's like, you know, if you have a model that looks exactly like this and the data points follow your model exactly, then you're going to have a mean absolute error of zero. So zero is what you want to shoot for. You want to get as close to zero as you can. By the way, if you get an actual zero, something is probably wrong with your model. I would just check. But you want to get close to zero. And then mean absolute error can be as big as you know, who knows? It can be as big as you want, right? It can be as big as the data allows. So there's no upper bound on mean absolute error. All right. And then the other thing that's important to remember is that mean absolute error, the unit of measurement is going to be whatever the unit of measurement is for your y axis, the thing that you're predicting. All right. So our mean absolute error is going to be somewhere between zero and affinity, and it's going to be in US dollars. All right. So that's mean absolute error. With that in mind, let's go back to our notebook and let's actually put together the code here. So I'm going to scroll down to where we are. Beautiful. And the way I'm going to calculate the mean absolute error is I'm going to take that mean absolute error function that we imported from the metrics module in scikit-learn. So I'll do mean absolute error. And mean absolute error takes two arguments. The first is it takes the true labels. So the true values, y train, and then our predicted values, which in this case is y predict baseline. Beautiful. And then what we're going to be doing here down below is we're going to print out two things. We're going to print out the mean apartment price, just so we have an idea of that. And then we're going to print out our baseline. And notice here that I'm just going to round these to two decimal places, just so we don't have a lot of decimal places here. So if I hit shift and enter, I can see that our mean apartment price is around 135,000. So 135,000. And what my baseline mean absolute error is telling me that it is, 
is that if I guessed 135,000 for every property in this data set, on average, I would be off, my guess, my estimates would be off, my predictions would be off by around $45,000, all right? So this means that in order for our model to be useful, we want a, a baseline, we want a mean absolute error, not a baseline mean absolute error, a mean absolute error that is less than $45,000, all right? So the die is cast, we know what we need to beat, so let's begin making our model. And with that, my dear friends, uh, I'm gonna call it an evening. Thanks so much for the gentleman from uh, Brazil and also Mark uh, Fish and Chips. Again, thanks so much for your time. As always, I'll see you hopefully here tomorrow evening for the final live stream of the week. Okay.